We shall now hear an address by the Prime Minister of Sweden, His Excellency Mr. Olof Palme. I invite him to come to the rostrum. We're shadowy agents from the apartheid regime involved in the assassination 37 years ago of Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palme. This news speaks to former diplomat, businessman, and author Jan Stocklasse. We also speak to veteran Swedish police authority officer Janneke Kjellberg who was seconded to the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Welcome, Mr. Stocklasse, Jan. Uh, thank you. As a former diplomat and businessman, how did you get involved in the investigation of the murder of Prime Minister Olaf Palmer? I would say it's a pure coincidence. I think most Swedish people are, have been interested in one way or another of the murder of our Prime Minister. Um, but I was actually doing research. I was going to write a book, my, my second book at the time. Um, and then I was doing research uh, for this book when I, re uh, by coincidence, found a paper on a person that had been a suspect in the murder of our prime minister. Uh, and when I asked uh, the person who had the, p the paper who wrote this, she said, uh, Stieg Larsson, the crime writer. Um, uh, and there may be more papers. And then I was, caught. I, I need to find out more. I needed to find out more. And how did you find out more? Uh, I continued to look for more papers uh, that he had wrote because she also said that he had been obsessed with the murder. And I think it took me some six months before I managed to, to find the main source where uh, Stieg Larsson's private papers had been put away after his death. Uh, and when we opened up the door to this rented storage, uh, there were 20 cardboard boxes full of documents of Stieg Larsson. And on some of them, it said, uh, the murder of Olaf Palme. So and how long started. did it take you to mine those documents? Well, I, I started immediately. I sat down and I started reading because I couldn't take the papers out from, from that place, uh, at least not in the beginning. Um, and then uh, I kept coming back. And I, and then I started scanning the papers. And then, so it took, I would say it took a couple of years before I've gone through most of the papers. I still haven't got through everything. And what did you find there? Uh, and then I found that Stieg Larsson had from day one, from the 1st of March, 1986, the day after the murder, he had been, Stieg had been extremely interested and even obsessed with the murder of our prime minister. Uh, and gradually I realized he even had his own theory of who was behind the murder. And what was his theory? His theory was that it was the South African security agencies uh, that instigated and organized uh, the assassination and that, uh, with a long, quite a long planning time. Uh, and then they were using uh, a middleman based in Northern Cyprus, a, name a man called Bertel Bedin, a Swedish citizen that moved to nor Northern Cyprus, a country without extradition agreements, uh, three months prior to the murder. And, and Bertel Vedin worked as a middleman um, to, to bring contacts to Swedish right-wingers based in Sweden that could work as helpers and possibly as uh, scapegoats or patsies. Um, so the, the, and then there were South African agents sent to, to Sweden to, to execute and possibly and uh, or either facilitate the actual uh, operation so how did you that take your the findings the theory. Sorry, sorry sorry to interrupt you how did you take your findings further um and Stig Larsson he died in 2004 and that was when his documents were packed away and he was interested until the day he de died but when i found it in 2013 uh, then i i I realized someone has to go and try to meet the people that he was pointing 
to. And that, that was what I did after that. I, I started traveling around Sweden. I went to Northern Cyprus and I also went to South Africa to meet with people that may have been involved in the murder of our prime minister. And what did those people tell you? They said that they were not involved. Uh, I, I would say all of them said that they were not involved, but they also told a, a very interesting story. And at this moment, I would say that I'm convinced that Stieg Larsson was right. It was some South Africans that were behind the murder um, and they were using uh, a middleman in Northern Cyprus. And there were also um, Swedish right-wingers that, um, that were involved in the actual operation. You then decided to write a book. Yes. And then I, yeah, uh, I, I, I was going to write, write a, a different book and then I, I, I had to change uh, track. So I started uh, to write the book that is now called, it was published in 2019 in English under the name, The Man Who Played With Fire, uh, Stig Larsson's Lost Files and the Hunt for an Assassin. And what was the conclusion you drew in that book? Uh, that it was the base, uh, I, I, the base theory is the South Africans with the middleman and, and the Swedish helpers. Uh, and then I come into much more detail of meeting the different people that may have been involved, uh, as well as uh, producing as much evidence as possible uh, that I handed in to the Swedish authorities uh, towards the, the end of the book and also in real life. Uh, and that I did that in 2018. Um, and what response um, did you get from the Swedish authorities to the, Swe the evidence you presented? Well, you have to remember that this is the world's largest murder investigation. It's, it's been compared to, it's actually larger than the JFK uh, murder investigation and uh, also compared to the Lockerbie bombing in investigation. Uh, so, it's, so it's a huge investigation. And at the time it was run by three or four elderly police officers that didn't do that much. But when I came with the material, they actually started doing, doing some things along those lines. Um, that, that I've now realized later what, what they did, because now we can actually get the documentation from that. Um, you know, so, so they did react to it. Um, but I, my feeling is that there was never enough manpower and efforts to be able to bring this to, to, to a real ending. Um, uh, instead in, um, 2000, early 2020, the police stepped out and said, we have solved the murder. Uh, we will present the solution. Uh, and some months later they, they did that. And that was sort of, I would say it's the biggest anti, anti claim climax in, in Swedish history, uh, because nobody seemed happy about it. Not even the police officers and, and prosecutor who were in the press conference. Everybody was disappointed by the result and they pointed to a lone gunman, a graphic uh, designer who, who was working overtime just next to the murder site and that he by coincidence, coincidence had a Magnum revolver with him, uh, ran into uh, the prime minister and shot him with one shot in the back and managed to kill him, which I don't believe, I would say nobody uh, almost nobody in Sweden believes it, and definitely not the police officers who presented that solution. But that's the offici official solution, and uh, that's where we are now. Do you think there's any chance of the case being officially reopened uh, if new evidence could be presented? Yes, I, I think there there is a, a chance. It might not that be that big, but it's uh, there are things going on, and even I, after the, the documentary has been has uh, premiered, I, I have been contacted by quite a few people, even more people than when the book was published. Uh, uh, and many of them say that they have information that is important. And I'm following up, uh, following up on some of those leads. Um, and I think there's a lot of things cooking. Uh, so it, it may happen. And then I think it, it, there's a, will be a much bigger chance because then there will be enough manpower. Um, the, the whole investigation has been digitized since they closed it down. And, um, and there will be so many thing, more things that you can do actually uh, with a new, a new attempt, another round. Now the documentary that's being screened worldwide now, based on your book, tell us about it. Does it take it further than the book? Yeah, the, the documentary was produced, well, last year and this year. So actually it's, it's much more up to date. 
and and there there is it includes a twist towards the end. I wouldn't I'd like to spoil that, but it actually shows, I would say, um, why and how South Africa would have been involved in it, and also why and how the investigation was uh, terminated and closed down in such a improbable way. I would say. That it's actually they they selected another solution because they had to, and that that's part of sort of the ending of of the of the series. And I think as a South African, um, you must be even more surprised and and uh, and interested than I when I than I was when I when I heard of this and I saw this the first time. Would you mind sharing that twist with our viewers who might never see the documentary? With a spoiler alert. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Yeah, so there, there's another Swedish diplomat. I'm an ex-diplomat, and he is also as well. And he has spent, been spending time separately in South Africa, contacting quite a few uh, people from the security services, from the apartheid security services, and also from present times, uh, in, including some generals also from, from both times. And he has uh, recorded... Uh, some of the, those conversations and that they show that there was negotiations going on between the South African authorities and the Swe Swedish authorities to come clean with the, with the, the, how the murder actually happened. Um, South Africans would, South, South African authorities would tell how it actually happened, uh, against amnesty, uh, for all people involved from South Africa. Uh, but those negotiations fell apart and that's part of those very interesting sound recordings that are, are shown in the document. And why did the negotiations fall apart? Well, that, that's, that's a question that is very hard to get to the bottom of because it, it, it's obviously not the, the civil police that were negotiating. It's not, not the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It must be on, on a, on a level that you have in South Africa and we have also say something like military intelligence or, or something similar, and they would never say what happened. Uh, so it would have been interesting to be a fly on the wall in that room or, or that place where it, where it took place, but I, I have no idea. The Are you going to make a statement to the South African authorities? No, I, I'm, I'm a Swedish citizen. I, I, I deal with Swedish authorities, so... I think it would have it would have to be someone with credibility in in South Africa. You have very good organizations um, uh, and people that would be able to do do something like that. But I don't think it's it's not appropriate for a Swedish citizens to do that, um, and I don't think it would help in any way. So someone in South Africa would have to do that. How hopeful are you of justice in, in this very cold case? Uh, Opening up the case is, is a higher chance than, than justice. And, and I, I don't think anybody's really interested in, um, that, 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 that's the most important to get the actual shooter. I think it's mo much more important to understand the mechanics behind it. What, what was it that triggered uh, this initiative to, to kill our prime minister and what was behind that? And, 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 and to understand that, that would, in some way be justice. And I think it would even, it would also help, for instance, the family of Olof Palma, who, who still struggles with this, uh, this enormous wound that it is in their, um, history. So, I, um, so justice probably as someone being convicted, probably not, uh, but definitely knowing the truth, that's much more likely. Thank you, Jan. That was Jan Stocklasser, the author of The Man Who Played With Fire. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. For comment, we turn to a police officer who has served in the Swedish police authority for 49 years. Welcome, Jan Ake Kjalber. Thank you very much, Chris. Jan, what motive would the South Africans have had to want the Swedish prime minister dead? Well, I think, uh, you know, when this, uh, when this, uh, assassina assassination occurred in Sweden in 1986, of course, there was a lot of discussions and, and, uh, about the possible motive to the murder. And, and one of the motives was, uh, uh, Sweden's and all of Palmer's support, strong support 
or the ANC and other liberation movements in, in outside and inside of, of South Africa. And uh, there was also a, a number of prominent members of ANC who suggested that the security forces in, in South Africa could be behind the murder. Uh, there was actually a conference in Stockholm just shortly before the murder in a, an ANC a conference in Stockholm in which, uh, for example, Oliver Tambo participated and all the leadership of the ANC at the time. And Oral Palme was the main speaker at that event. And he uh, again uh, confirmed his support for the ANC as the rightful uh, government of, of South Africa. And we know also that Sweden, uh, through different ways, financially supported ANC and possibly the biggest contributor to the financial the contributor to ANC inside and outside South Africa. Uh, Olaf Palme was also a, 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 you know, a supporting sanction in the UN against uh, the South African government. So I think there was uh, strong tips for for the, gov the, 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 the government at the time to, to see all of Palme as, as a, a big enemy to the state, to the South African state, because of his actions. Uh, I think that was, uh, you know, uh, why people actually saw this as a possible uh, motive and a possibility that the South African security uh, forces was behind the murder. And did the security forces at that time have a capability to have the prime minister of another country assassinated on the street? Well, I, I would think so. We know for a fact that um, there was a lot of uh, uh, you know, activities in Europe at the time. You know, we know, for example, that Dulce September was uh, murdered in Paris. Uh, uh, and there was also an attempt to murder Gottfried Mazepi in Belgium at the same time. Uh, we also saw what they did at, uh, against the ANC office in London, in the central part of London, you know, where they flew in a team of uh, security branch officers and blew up the office in central London. Uh, and they got also promoted or they got the rewards for what they did in London at the time. So certainly they had the capacity. Uh, to do this. And we, of course, know what they did in the neighbor states in, in Africa when it comes to uh, murder. Uh, so there was certainly a capacity and a capability to do that. Of course, so, uh, the murder of a prime minister is something really, really different from, from many things. So I, I, that, that needed to be, I think, handled I mean, carefully and also uh, in a special way, but, uh, since, uh, Palme was such, an uh, uh, I mean, against, uh, apartheid regime, I think it, it could have been, uh, it could have been targeted because of that. Now you were seconded to the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Did any evidence relating to this murder, uh, come before you? No, I think, uh, the big, um, I should say opening event for, for this link in, in, within the truth commission was Eugene de Kock's testimony in, in court, uh, where he alleged that he had information about a possible link between the South African, between South Africa and the murder of Olaf Palmer. Uh, he claimed that he got information, uh, by Philip Powell, uh, and, uh, and also the name of the, of the murderer, uh, the, that started actually within the truth commission, uh, an investigation into this. And, um, then there was other, you know, uh, I should say other links and other kinds of information. We also had a, a military intelligence officer based in Maputo who had strong connections with Sweden who was also investigator in, in connection with the murder of Olaf Palme. But I would say that nothing was actually 
was nothing was came to its end. You know, it was never concluded the investigations. Uh, obviously, the Cox uh, information was secondhand or thirdhand information, and it was difficult to 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 continue or co conclude that investigation. Um, so nothing really was um, enough to continue any sort of investigation of the Truth Commission. But I would say also because of that, there has been a lot of interest in Sweden for a possible link to the South African security forces. A number of journalists and, and, and people have written articles about uh, possible links. Um, so this has, uh, we, I think it's still alive today, this uh, theory about the South African link. Uh, and I uh, think it will continue until the day that we possibly find out the truth about the uh, murder of our prime minister. What are the chances of the investigation being reopened? I think at the time, you know, it's 37 years ago uh, since uh, the murder of Olof Palme. It's a long time. Uh, a lot of the people who might have been involved in South Africa are getting old or or at the or then at the moment the same with us Swedes we are also getting older uh, believe it or not uh, and uh, there has been a number of different sets up of the investigation teams in in Sweden and uh, at the moment it's closed the investigation it's closed since 2020 uh, and uh, the the prosecutor at the time decided to close it because his main suspect the Swede uh, had passed, had the past, you know, and uh, so he couldn't, according to his opinion, continue the investigation. But it can be open anytime, yes. when any sort of uh, evidence turns up again, it could be reopened by another prosecutor. So that is possible, uh, but uh, there needs to be very, very strong indications or evidence. Actually, more or less, we need to we need to place the the murder at the crime scene with his with the gun in, in his hand, you know, to be able to 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 take it further into a court. And so it, it's very difficult, but it can happen. Yes, or a confession, a confession. But you know, a confession is not enough. Uh, we mm -hmm. have had uh, more than hundred uh, people who have confessed to the murder. Uh, so uh, that's not enough. We need to prove it. Yes. Also. Have you had a chance to look at the documentary that is out now that is based on uh, Jan Stocklas's book, The Man Who Played With Fire, in which he also concludes that uh, South African agents um, were involved? Yes, I have seen this documentary. Uh, it's a very, uh, you know, say a professional film, you know, with a you know, fantastic uh, setup. Uh, and all of it is very high quality, which makes people, I think, to to believe that this must be true because it's presented in the way it is. Um, and of course, he is into uh, what Steve Larson uh, uh, investigated uh, while he still was alive, uh, but he passed uh, early 2000, so that's long time ago. And then he links it to other information that another. Um, private investigator had obtained in, have obtained in South Africa. Uh, well, so it's a lot of speculations. It's absolutely uh, not any new information that came out of Stig Larsson's archive, because this is something that he uh, discussed with other colleagues uh, during the 90s, so nothing really new in that. Uh, what is new is the, the information from South Africa. Uh, but looking into that information, I am convinced that this was just a scam. Uh, there has been uh, 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 other cases of people looking in, looking for the reward on this, uh, from this investigation. You know, the Swedish government set up a, an award of 50 million Swedish crowns a long time ago for any information that could lead to solve the, the murder. And that's a lot of money, uh, 50 million Swedish crowns. It's about uh, 5 million euro. Uh, and um, well, I know for a fact that in this case, as soon as uh, the, this private investigation mentioned the reward, uh, things started to happen. And people who, who you couldn't believe 
uh, started to to gather information and present information, which was, uh, you know, claiming to be the the truth about the South African involvement. Uh, but I am convinced that the people engaged in this was just uh, people who acted to get the money, uh, because there are so many circumstances around this uh, information that is so. Uh, 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 I should say it's it's, un, it, it's unbelievable uh, in uh, more or less. Uh, I don't know if you want uh, me to mention some of the names that uh, appears in 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 the in the film. Yes, please do. Uh, I mean, one of the main characters, or at least the starting point of this uh, private investigator's work, was uh, uh, General Trunewald. Uh, uh, the infamous uh, general from you know military intelligence in the past. He was uh, the guy who actually stopped when he heard about the reward. He set this private investigator in contact with some people, dubious people, who claimed to be acting uh, generals within the South African uh, military intelligence today, and that they had been tossed by the by the. Um, defense uh, sh defense management to proceed with some sort of nego negotiations between the Swedish government and the South African government. Uh, and uh, this guy, private investigator, was, uh, was uh, uh, so appointed as the middleman, as the, the broker of information between South Africa and Sweden. And uh, we just don't believe it. He had to pay the tickets, for example, for one of the guys to come to Sweden and talk to the people at the intelligence service in Sweden. Uh, he also asked for money to buy the information that the South African government was supposed to provide the Swedish government. So all the details in this is typically a scam. They were looking for the money. And I don't think, I never ever believe, from my experience, from the work I did in it, it will not happen that uh, they will uh, they will uh, so easily 37 years after the murder come up with the answer uh, of a possible link so I still believe it's quite possible that the South African got, uh, security forces was behind it but uh, behind the murder of our prime minister it's possible it's a theory it's a puzzle but this the solution will not happen this way. I'm, I'm convinced that it was a scam. Thank you very much, Jan. That was Bisnew speaking to a long-serving Swedish police authority officer and a former diplomat about the possibility that shadowy agents from South Africa's apartheid past could have been involved in the assassination of Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palmer 37 years ago.